Gas prices are skyrocketing right now, due in large part to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. The U.S. countrywide average just surpassed $4.30 a gallon. California is well on its way to $6 a gallon. Here in Canada, Vancouver has already blown past $2 a liter, and it looks like the rest of the country is not that far behind. This is a big deal. Gas prices play an outsized role in people's perceptions and experiences of the cost of living, because transportation is a basic need and gas is particularly volatile compared to food or housing. When prices go up, people really do hurt. A 2008 study found that 80% of low-income workers in the U.S. commute by car, most of them alone in their own vehicle. Under a high gas price scenario equal to $5.20 a gallon in today's dollars, they calculated that low-income solo car commuters have to dedicate almost 9% of their income solely to buying gas to get to work. That's absurd, and it doesn't include other car-related expenses or money spent on gas to go anywhere else. A few years ago, when the price of gas was about two thirty a gallon, Americans were asked in a survey how high it would have to go before they would drive much less or seriously seek alternatives to driving. The average answer that people gave was four forty a gallon. That's pretty much where we are today, so let's talk about alternatives to driving. As a society, we're very much used to thinking about this in terms of individual choices, considering carpooling, taking public transit, dusting off an old bike, or maybe even buying an e-bike. Considering changes that you can make in your own life is great. A lot of people are surprised, for example, at how useful bikes can be. They're basically like a range extender for walking, allowing you to cover three to five times more distance in the same amount of time. But even more important than people's individual choices about how to get around are our collective choices about how to design and build our cities. We often have the impression that driving is the default obvious way to get around and everything else is a sacrifice, either unpleasant or impractical. But this is largely because since World War II, we've generally built our cities to encourage driving and discourage other modes in fundamental ways that we often don't realize. Density is important in any discussion of alternatives to driving. Zoning policies that limit density are often done in the name of avoiding traffic at the local level. But spreading cities out forces people to cover longer distances to get where they need to go, which encourages driving over walking and cycling. Public transit can cover longer distances, but if you limit the number of people who can live near a station or line, you make it harder to financially support the high frequencies that people find convenient. Zoning in North America also often goes further to separate people from their destinations, by concentrating stores into big shopping malls, often on the edge of town, isolated from residential areas, as opposed to the traditional pattern of stores being more integrated into residential neighborhoods in close proximity to people's homes. Beyond density and zoning, road design matters a lot too. If you have big, wide arterial roads with loud, fast-moving traffic, infrequent intersections with long traffic lights, and big parking lots in front of every business, you are basically requiring people to drive if they want anything remotely resembling a practical or comfortable experience. We can see how much infrastructure and design matter from the simple fact that places with different infrastructure and design have very different mobility patterns. Let's take a look at Ottawa, Canada's mid-sized capital city. In more suburban districts like Kanata and Orleans, 75% of local within-district trips are done by car. We're talking about getting groceries, taking your kids to school, visiting friends, going to the gym, and some shorter commutes. In the Ottawa inner area, the central residential district that includes areas like Sandy Hill, Centertown, The Glebe, and Old Ottawa South, just 30% of these local trips are done by car. That's an enormous difference, and as anyone who knows the city can tell you, central Ottawa is hardly some European urbanist paradise. This is basically just traditional pre-war North American development. Much of the land is still taken up by detached homes, but they're built relatively densely, with some exceptions. And there's a reasonable diversity of other housing types, with multiplexes and apartments mixed in, some older and some newer. This part of the city has a highway and some wide arterial roads, But the main shopping streets like Bank and Elgin, which used to have streetcars, are relatively human-scale and pedestrian-friendly. Matt Pinder has an interesting article about walking down Bank Street and seeing the transition from traditional pedestrian and transit-focused design to newer car-centric development. None of this is unique to Ottawa. There's a good chance your city or even suburb has neighborhoods in different parts of the spectrum, too. Lots of Canadian suburbs do a good job of having schools in the middle of residential neighborhoods and accessible by foot or bike, for example. Car dependency is a massive problem in North America, ingrained into our laws, expectations, and assumptions. But most of the ingredients to the solution are already here. 
If we can relearn some of these components of traditional design, then maybe we don't have to be quite as stressed about the cost of gas, or the much bigger general cost to buy and maintain so many vehicles, which altogether costs the average Canadian household between five and $16,000 per year, depending on whether we're talking about a single-person household or a couple with children. Obviously, building a more balanced city doesn't mean that no one will ever need or want to drive. Some people carry heavy tools to work, and some people have family to visit in the countryside, among other reasons. But we can and should build cities so that driving is not a basic requirement by default, where people can drive less and own fewer cars. Despite pretty high rates of licensed drivers, people in Ottawa's central residential neighborhoods own about half as many cars per capita as people in the suburbs, but they still make just as many trips per day, in large part due to walking. That's a win for their finances, their health, and the environment. The mobility statistics that we looked at here only included within-district trips to show the effect of local neighborhood design. We ignored trips to other districts, like commuting downtown, because older, more central neighborhoods have the advantage of proximity. Someone from the distant suburbs just can't bike downtown at any reasonable time, and they don't necessarily have a direct transit route either. With that said, it's hard to separate density from location. A denser, more compact city allows you to live closer to things. It can be the difference between a 5km commute and a 15km commute, which has an enormous impact on what types of transportation are practical and convenient. Thanks for watching through to the end of the video. Don't forget to reconsider your assumptions about the inevitability of car dependence. And subscribe. A special thanks to our supporters on Patreon. 